Almighty God, we come to you and thank you so much for today, this opportunity to be in your house and to worship you and, and hear your word preached. Lord, we pray that, uh, first off, we wouldn't take that for granted, but second of all, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would do something inside of us, change us, mold us, shape us into the men and women that you call us to be. So open our minds and our hearts uh, this afternoon as we hear your word, that you would convict us of what we need to do to change, to be more like you. We thank you again. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and take a seat. And as you are, grab your Bible or your app, your mobile, whatever you've got your Bible on, and turn to Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to grab one out of the back of the pew. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible home with you. We would want you, we, we desire for everyone here at Calvary to have a Bible at their house where they can read day in and day out and refer to. Uh, so that's our gift to you. Take it home with you if you need that. We would love for you to have it. Um, let me introduce myself as I usually do. My name is Chad. Uh, some of you, many of you know me as the OC. Uh, that's short for the other Chad because uh, our lead pastor here is Chad also. Um, for the next week and a half, you can address me as the great bearded one also. Um, there is a limited time that this is going to remain. Uh, and speaking of that, I, I would ask that you pray for me. Um, if you are pro-beard, I, I would pray that you would, uh, you know, pray that God would uh, allow my wife to have uh, favor with my beard. Um, <laughs> And that she would let me keep it after the passion plays over. Um, which is why I'm growing it. If you haven't heard, uh, I'm playing Jesus in the passion play. And uh, so that's what all this is about. Uh, I don't normally do this just day in and day out. Um, and as a shameless plug, guys, if uh, you haven't set a day aside to come watch the passion play, it's, uh, it starts a week from tomorrow. We've got four uh, performances. Uh, it'll be Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. There are tickets out in the foyer. It's free. You don't need a ticket, but you can take as many as you want and hand them out to your friends as invitations. Um, we want as many people to come and see and experience uh, what Christ did for them on the cross uh, so that they can see and hear his love uh, in their lives. So yeah, if you're pro-beard, uh, pray that my beard would find favor in my wife's uh, eyes. Um, and if you're anti-beard, um, let me reason with you for a, mo a moment. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, and I quote, And we who with unveiled faces reflect the glory of God. My unveiled face reflects the glory of God. And also... Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 calls us to be imitators of Christ. So Jesus had a beard. I have a beard. I'm an imitator of Christ through this. Um, as doing that, I am being more obedient to God's calling in my life through having a beard. And so my reasoning therefore is if you're anti-beard... And God's word tells me that my unveiled face is the glory of God and that I'm supposed to be an imitator of Christ. My question to you, if you're anti-beard, is are you really saved? Do you, do you know the state of your salvation with Jesus Christ if you think this is wrong? I'm just, that's what the Bible says. You guys want to laugh and you want to joke, but I'm quoting God's word here. That, that's, <laughs> you know, that's a great example of taking something out of context to make it mean what you want, right? <laughs> but seriously, I really want to keep the beard, so pray for me. Um, but speaking of Jesus in a truly theological way that doesn't borderline on heresy like I just did, um, look at your Bibles. <laughs> Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 39. Let me give you the background. Jesus has just gotten done with the Lord's Supper, with the, the, room, the upper room supper, with the disciples, the Passover. He's just gotten done with that. Obviously, we're starting a new sermon series. Uh, we're going to be walking through the, the last few hours of Jesus' life leading up to the, res, uh, the crucifixion and then the resurrection. So they've just gotten done with the Last Supper. And Jesus and the disciples have left 
the upper room and have walked out to the Garden of Gethsemane. So pick up in verse 39 in Luke chapter 22. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is the perfect example of surrender. And that's the whole focus of this message this afternoon, is surrendering to God. Jesus here exemplifies what surrender looks like in his own life. So to start out with, one thing I want you to notice, the first thing I want you to notice, is surrender involves a relationship with the one we are surrendering to. Surrender involves a relationship with the one that we are surrendering to. You see, without a relationship with Jesus, the surrender that I'm talking about here is impossible. And for proof of this, look at verse 39. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. In other words, this passage is telling us pretty clearly that Jesus, on a very regular basis, went off by himself and prayed. He was intentional about working on his relationship with God the Father. He was all the time seeking opportunities that he could go and be by himself so that he could pray and work on that relationship. And guys, I don't know about you, but I'm not the son of God. I don't have that good of a relationship with God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. So if Jesus needed to do it, I'm pretty sure I do. Right? So if Jesus needed that ongoing relationship with God the Father in order to surrender to him, I think it's safe to say that we need that relationship also. You see, Jesus' surrender was dependent on his relationship with God. It wasn't just good that he had a relationship. It was dependent. And so is ours. Our ability, our ability to do surrender or not do it is completely dependent on our relationship with him. The surrender that we're talking about is based on faith. It's something that we have to have a relationship with. You see, this kind of surrender is unique. It's different from any other kind of surrender that we think of. Because most surrenders are forced by an enemy, but Jesus wants us to surrender willingly. Most surrenders are forced on us by an enemy, but Jesus wants us to do it willingly. Think about it for a second. Outside of a church context, if I say the word surrender, you see it in a movie or hear about it somewhere, what does it mean? It means somebody lost and the winner is making them submit, right? It's forced. It's something that we don't want. It's something that we don't have a choice in. It's forced on us. That's what we usually think of when we talk about surrender. But in this case... Jesus asks us to willingly surrender to him. He doesn't force us. He doesn't make us do it. He doesn't twist our arm. He just says, will you? He asks us to step in a relationship with him and in doing so, surrender to his will. Look at verse 42. Because even Jesus had a choice. Look at this. Verse 42. And praying, he said, Father... If you're willing, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The surrender we're talking about is based on faith. It's based on trust. If you ever see a movie where two armies are fighting and one wins and the other has to surrender, faith and trust are not part of that equation. But it is when it comes to our surrendering to Christ. Here's the hard part, though. It's never easy, is it? Surrender, no matter what kind of surrender you're talking about, it's not an easy or pleasant thing. And quite frankly, that's okay. 
It's okay if it's not easy. You see, surrendering is about his plan, his timing, and his word. It's about his plan, his timing, and his word. Jesus told God what he wanted to happen. He told him how he wanted this to play out. But then he followed that by saying, but you know what, God, if you don't want to do it that way, it's your will, not mine, and I will follow your will. So let's think about this for a second. His plan. His plan is hard because we, as his followers, are stepping into the unknown, aren't we? It's not our plan. It's not, it's not our thinking that is going to take us down that road. It's God's plan. And most of the time, he doesn't share with us the details of where that plan's going to take us, does it? So we've got, we're, we've got unknown. We, we don't know where we're going or what's going to happen to us. But God does. And that's where faith comes in. That's where our hope is, is that we don't know what the plan is and we don't know what the future holds. But God does know the plan. He does know the future. And his Bible promises that the plans that he has for us are for our own good and for his glory. And so we have to have faith. We have to trust him. We have to say, you know what, Lord? I know that you've got a good plan for me, so I'm gonna trust in that plan. And so here's my encouragement to you. You've gotta let go of the control. Oh, man. Let go of control. That's the one thing that keeps me sane is knowing that I have some semblance of control in my life. But God says, no, 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 no. If you surrender to me, you give me all the control. You've got to let go of all your circumstances, let go of all of your relationships, let go of everything you have in your life and trust me with those things. It's his plan. And so we've got to let go and we've got to stop manipulating the situations that we're in because we do that, don't we? Oh God, I'm going to give you all of this. I give you control but I'm gonna move this over here so that maybe it'll go a little closer to the way that I desire it to go. We've gotta stop manipulating and trying to make God's plan move closer to our plan. So stop holding on to the control. Stop manipulating. And let God handle your life. He knows your future and he's got a great plan for you if you'll let go. Which brings us to timing. Because how many of us get frustrated with God's timing because it's not our timing, right? We get so frustrated because, you know what? This is not the way I wanted it. And not only that, it's not happening at the pace that I want it. So we force things. We try to push God. We try to make things happen on our timeline instead of his. And what ends up happening to us? We get hurt in the process. I have a three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old boy at home. His name's Knox, great little kid, love him to death. But he wants to have control. And if I gave my son complete control of his life, would that be a good decision on my part? No. Would he make choices that would be beneficial to him or would he make choices that would be destructive to him? Destructive. Think about it for a second. If it was up to Knox to figure out what to eat day in and day out, what is he probably going to eat? Exactly. He's not going to eat good stuff that's good for him, that's going to make him grow and be healthy. He's going to eat things that are satisfying to his desires. And down the road, it's going to physically hurt him. Probably by throwing up. (laughs) The fact of the matter is, is when we take control and we try to push the timing, what happens? We may be satisfied immediately in that moment, But somewhere down the road, we're going to get hurt because our control and our timing leads to our destruction. It does because our desires are sinful, aren't they? If I didn't have self-control in my life, I would be destructive to myself. But thank the Lord that he's given me a little bit of it. The fact of the matter is, is just like that three and a half year old that lives in my house, I have control over his life. Well, some control over his life. And my control is for his benefit. 
I don't let him eat whatever he wants and I don't let him watch TV all day, every day because those kinds of things would destroy him eventually. And God's telling us the same thing. If you'll give me control, I'll make you healthy. I'll benefit you. I'll help you along the road. But if you keep following your control and you keep doing things in your timing, it's leading you down a road of destruction. You may not feel it now, but you will later down the road. And so give up the control. Give up the timing. And lastly, depend on God's word. There's a guy named Justin Peters. I heard him years ago when I still lived in Texas. Great preacher. And he has this to say. He says, if you want to hear from God, read your Bible. If you want to hear from God audibly, read your Bible out loud. Right? It's the truth. If we want to know what God's desires are for our life, if we want to know what his plans are, it's all in his book. And all we have to do is open it and read it and understand it. That's asking a lot, though. I mean, most of you have 14, 15 Bibles in your house, and you've got one on your app, and you've got one on your mobile device, and, and you've got tons of Bibles, but how often do we open them, and how often do we read them? We are the most blessed culture in the history of man when it comes to God's Word. There are more Bibles in existence right now than there ever has been in all of history. As a matter of fact, before the 1500s, people didn't have access to Bibles at all. If you wanted to know what God's Word said, you had to go to church every Sunday morning and listen and hope that you retained the knowledge because they didn't have a way to mass produce Bibles. But we've got Bibles all over the place. We give them away for free here at Calvary. You can take one from the pew right now and walk out with it. And we're glad for that. But we've got to read it. And we've got to follow it. And here's where I'm going to step on toes. If your plan or your desire contradicts God's word, your plan and your desire is wrong. Period. End of story. There's no discussion on this. God's word is the final word. But how many times do we hear people encourage others, oh yeah, get divorced. That's God's desire for you because you're in a horrible marriage. Bull! God's word commands us to stay married and to work on our relationship. But we ignore God's word because it's easier to go get a divorce, don't we? We've got to pay attention to what God's word commands us. If it contradicts it, it's wrong. Enough said. We've got to be willing to follow it no matter how difficult following it is, no matter how uncomfortable it is to do what he tells us in his word. And while I'm on that topic, we need to pray like God prays, like Jesus prayed. Think about it for a second. Jesus, in the most difficult, excruciating moment of his life, a moment that none of us in this room will ever experience as difficult or bad as Jesus experienced, what did he pray? God, Take this cup. I don't want it. I have no desire to die. I mean, think about it for a second. Jesus did not wake up that morning and go, ha ha, it's Friday. You know what Friday means. I'm going to the cross, baby. Woo! That is not Jesus' attitude in this situation. What is it? I don't want to do this, God. I don't want to be here. I don't want to have to die. I don't want to have to be tortured. And he told God that. He told God plainly, I don't want to do this, but if it's your will, I'll do it. Because it's not about me, it's about you. That's what he does. But how many times when we're going through a difficult situation, or we know someone who's suffering, or somebody who's dying, we go, God, heal this person, please, Lord, heal them, heal them, heal them, and we stop there. When in reality, if we follow Jesus' example, what are we supposed to do? God, heal this person. Heal them. That's our desire. We want this. But if that's not your desire, I'm okay with it. If your desire is to take that person right now, I don't know why you're doing it, but I trust you in it. But we don't have that kind of faith a lot of times. We want what we want, and if it's different, if God's desire is different than what we want, we get upset. That's not the way Jesus handled it. And I don't know about you, but recently I've not prayed that God would keep me from having to be crucified and beaten and all that stuff. 
Jesus went through a more difficult situation than any of us will ever experience, and he still prayed that God's will would be done and not his. That's what he calls us to do because we don't know his plans, so wherever his plans take us, we have to be okay with that. So, I've kind of stepped on toes and I've kind of stand on my soapbox for a little bit, but now I'm going to give the good news. Not only are we called to submit and surrender and do all this stuff, but when we surrender, we need to look for God's support. We need to watch for his support in the situation. Look at verse 43. Jesus has just prayed, take this cup, I don't want it, but if it's your will, be done. And it says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. That's support. You see, if you surrender, he will support you. Whether you see that support or not, he's going to support you. You know, look for the miracle. Look for that amazing, miraculous way that God's going to support you. But if the miracle doesn't happen, just understand that he's doing something behind the scenes that you're not seeing that is supporting you in that moment. Think about it for a second. You go through a difficult time and you go, God, I can't do this. I need you to help me, support me, provide a miracle. And he doesn't provide a miracle that you see. But three months later, you go, wow, I made it through that. Praise you, God. And you realize at that moment that you made it through it through his strength. Not through your own. He provided strength that you otherwise would not have had. Right? God does that all the time. Which brings me to a statement that's totally unbiblical, but everybody always says it. The statement is, well, God's not going to give me more than I can handle. It's the most unbiblical statement I've ever heard in my life. The actual Bible verse says... God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. In other words, he's going to provide a way out no matter what the temptation is so that you don't sin. He's going to give you a way out so you don't fall into that sin. But the whole theme of God's word is God putting us and other people through situations that we would never be able to handle on our own and giving us ways to handle it, right? Thinking of passages like, Through the weak, God shames the strong. Through the unwise, God shames the wise. Guys, when we go through difficult difficult situations, God helps us and supports us. He's going to constantly put you in situations that you cannot handle. It's part of being a follower of Christ. But he's always going to provide a way to get through it. He's always going to support you. He's going to pick you up. He's going to drag you along, kicking and streaming. Whatever that looks like, he's going to provide a way to get through it. But it's going to be a situation that on your own, you never would have made it otherwise. The only way you made it was through his strength, through his power, through his provision. So don't think that God's never going to put you through something you can't handle. No, he's going to put you through a lot that you can't handle. But he's going to give you the help that you need to make it through it. So think about that for a minute. He is here to support us. He is here when we surrender. He's here to help us. Again, it's about relationship, isn't it? We have a loving relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and he helps us through every circumstance that he throws our way. Speaking of support, one thing I want you to notice in this is that surrender involves a relationship with others. Relationship or surrender involves a relationship with others. Look at verses 39 and 40 for this. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Guys, Jesus took others with him. So I think it's safe to assume that we can take others when we're going through difficult times. It's okay to bring others along. It's okay to ask for help. If the Son of God had to ask for help, I think we should be willing to ask for help. Right? God wants us to surround ourselves with godly people who will lift us up, encourage us, and support us when we go through those trying times. But too many of us go, you know what, I don't need any help. I can make it all on my own. 
We don't ask for help. We get full of ourselves and our own pride. And instead of going to others for help, the situation get, lasts longer because we didn't get the help we needed or we suffer more through the situation because of our own pride and unwillingness to ask for help. Jesus asked for help. I think it's good to say that you can. We all need help. But I want you to notice something in this. Jesus just didn't take anyone. He selected carefully. So you need to select them carefully as well. Select them carefully. Matthew chapter 26, which also tells this story, says that they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. He had all the disciples with him. And they got to the gate. He goes in and he said, all right, all of you stay except you, you, and you. And he brought three of them in to the garden to pray with him. He selected three out of all the disciples to come in and be close to him to help him during that time. Right? Peter, James, and John. So he takes them in and he selected them from the group of disciples. So, I mean, think about it for a second. The disciples are sitting there. They get to the garden and they go, all right, let's go in. Jesus goes, no, 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 you're not going in. Actually, you, you, and you are going in. The rest of you stay here. Oh, man, I didn't get selected again. Got picked last. That was actually a blessing for them because they didn't get to see all the bad stuff that happened. But think about it for a second. If Jesus, the Son of God, selected someone to go in with him, it's okay for us to be selective about that as well. Because we can surround ourselves with a bunch of different kinds of people, can't we? There are the kinds of people in our lives that will encourage us to surrender to God. These are those wise, intelligent, godly people that we look up to. Those are the kinds of people that God is encouraging us to surround ourselves with. The people that see us in those difficult times and go, you know, I know this is not what you want to hear, but you need to follow God. You need to stick with God. Your faith will make you through, help you through it, and I'll be here the whole time. Those are the kinds of people that God wants us to surround ourselves with. The other kind of people are those that when you go through a difficult situation, they go, you know what, you need to ditch God because this path is way, way easier. If you'll just turn to this or do this instead of following God and what he tells you to do, it'll make it so much easier on you. And it may. It may make it easier in the moment, but somewhere down the road it's going to destroy you. Because we need, to, we need to follow God's plan and we need to push people away who are encouraging us to not follow God's plan. If they're telling us to defy God, then we've got a problem. And then there's the third group, like the disciples, the people that fall asleep. In the time of need, they're asleep. And there could be many reasons. As a matter of fact, in this passage, the passage points out that they didn't just fall asleep, they fell asleep for sorrow. In other words, these guys were exhausted. They were spent. Think about their week. They've spent all week being badgered and beaten up verbally and emotionally by the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. They've been questioned and ridiculed and made fun of all week long, and they just got done with the Last Supper. What happened at the Last Supper? Judas got called out in the middle of the meal. Have you ever been to a family meal and someone gets in an argument at the dinner table? That's not pleasant. It's emotionally draining. And these guys have had nothing but emotionally draining moments all week long. And now, not only that, when they're in the garden, it's literally the middle of the night. They should have been in bed hours ago. And Jesus is asking them to sit and be quiet. Sorry, I'm going to Snoozeville too. That's hard. But guys, we have those people in our lives who in those moments of crisis, they say they're going to be there and then they don't show up, don't they? People will always disappoint us. People are always going to disappoint us. Guys, I've disappointed hundreds of thousands of people in my life and I'm a young guy and I'm a pastor. I disappoint constantly and it's not something I do intentionally. It's something that I mess up on. The disciples did not intentionally go in to the garden going, hey, as soon as Jesus gets a stone's throw away, we're snoozing. 
They didn't do it intentionally. They fell asleep because they were exhausted. And a lot of times people let us down, not because they intentionally meant to hurt us, but because of circumstances that we may not know about. So let's flip this around for a second. What kind of friend are you? What kind of friend are you? Are you that first kind of person that's godly and wise, and when you see one of your friends going through a difficult situation, you go to that person and say, I'm going to be here for you, I'm going to help you, but you got to stick with God, man. you got to stay with God, you got to stay faithful to Him, and here's what God's Word tells you you should do. Are you that kind of person? Or are you the kind of friend who, when someone's going through a difficult time, you go to them and say, dude, even if just for a month, you need to just ditch God and go do this other thing, because that'll be way easier on you. God's not going to bless that. So why are you telling people to do it? Well, you got a rough marriage. I can see why you'd want to get divorced. You know, if I was in your situation, I'd get a divorce too. So yeah, yeah, that's probably the best plan. Go ahead and get a divorce. No, that's not God's plan. That's not God's desire. Or are you the third kind of person? Now let me stay here for a moment because I'm really hoping that most of you are the first kind of person because you're sitting in these pews. I'm hoping that you're the first kind of person, but even the first kind of person, the person who encourages people to surrender to God, even those people are gonna fall. They're gonna mess up. And it may not be your fault. It may be something that you that slipped through or something like that. But when somebody around you is going through a difficult time, be there for them. Help them through that. Support them. Encourage them. Lift them up. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy that says, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be here for you. I'll be here tomorrow morning at eight o'clock and then you never show. Don't be that guy. Don't. Instead, do what God calls you to do and be there and, and then hopefully God will honor that and provide people for you when you go through difficulty. Don't be the second or the third guy. Be the first one. Be that godly honorable person that encourages your friends to surrender to God and follow his plan, follow his timing, follow what his word commands. Be that person. And if you do slip, go apologize. If you're caught sleeping, apologize and make up for it maybe. I don't know. But look for those ways to help others. Be that person. After all, People are going to let you down all the time, but Christ will never let you down. Christ will be there for you all the time. And he calls us to be imitators of him, so we need to be there for our friends all the time. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for this amazing passage of how Jesus handles the most difficult situation any of us could imagine. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us, that you would show us, that you would help us to understand what it means to be a true follower of Christ in this way. Help us to hold true to your word, to your timing, to your plan, to surrender to you and encourage the people around us to surrender to you. Help us understand how amazing it is that your son surrendered to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be saved. Help us to appreciate that and understand that so that we can live our lives the way you've called us to. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship.